everybody to our little uh, early getting started presentation. Main presentation will start shortly, but I'm going to do a little presentation right now, or I'm just going to ch chat for a little while right now uh, for people that are uh, kind of getting started, kind of telling you a little bit about the uh, Texas RIAs, what we're all about. I am not Shanoa Grove. Shanoa Grove is uh, my wife and the president of Texas RIAs. She's actually at a conference right now. We're big believers in continuous learning, so she's uh, at a uh, seminar learning uh, some advanced negotiating skills, uh, which means I am going to be hosting the presentation tonight. Uh, just to let you know, we've got a market update put together for you. We've got some advanced real estate training and a lot of other goodies uh, to, uh, to go through. But before we do all that, I kind of want to open up to the audience and ask you guys a question. How many of you are just kind of getting started investing in real estate? Let's do a little survey of the, real, of, of the room. Okay, quite a, quite a few of you. So let me ask you a question. Is anybody working on a deal that maybe you're having a little bit of a challenge with? Anybody working on a deal right now? Raise your hand if you got a deal. Uh, maybe a deal? You got something? What's, what's that? So it's in escrow? Okay, so you got the deal pretty much under contract. You're just waiting to close. What, what kind of a deal is it? Just curious. Uh, one of them is a single family. Single family? Is a fourplex. A fourplex, so both residential. Um, okay, and uh, are they fix and flips or buy and holds or? Buy and holds. Buy and holds. Okay, great. Um, anybody working on a project, trying to get a deal under contract? You got something you're trying to get under contract? Okay, let's talk about that. Would you mind stepping up for the microphone? I want to do a little interview and see if there's anything we can do to maybe help you get that uh, project uh, under contract or just kind of talk about it. How'd you find the deal, by the way? Uh, we saw it through a wholesaler and then reached out. Uh, they actually dropped the uh, seven plex because they couldn't sell it. And then we reached out directly to the owner and okay. started talking so, about it. So when you found the deal, you found it from a wholesaler. Did they have it under contract? They did initially. I never reached out to them about it. Um, we did at a later point, and they lost the contract at that point, and so we went directly to the owner. Okay. So just to coach everybody a little bit, um, wholesalers are people, real estate investors, everybody wholesales maybe at different times, that simply get properties under contract, and then instead of buying the property, they sell their equitable of interest. They sell the contract. So if I get a property under contract for, let's say, $100,000, I have what's called an equitable interest in the property. That contract itself gives me, the buyer, the rights to buy the property at whatever terms the contract says. In that example, $100,000. If I want to, I can sell my contract to somebody else. I could say, hey, give me $20,000 and I will assign the contract to you, giving you the right to buy the property for $100,000. So I make 20, no risk, no money, uh, and then you can go buy the property for 100, it really cost you 120 because you had to pay me 20 and then you have to go ahead and buy it for 100. And there's a lot of real estate investors that are wholesalers, right? Getting properties under contract. And it's one of many different strategies that we use and that we teach, especially new investors, because it's no money and no risk. And there's many different no money, no risk, but this is just an example of one of them. Now, some warnings though about wholesalers. There's a lot of wholesalers out there that uh, don't actually have any money. Uh, they're just trying to get properties under contract, that's okay, but they're telling the seller I'm gonna buy the property with really no necessary intention of ever buying the property. They're just trying to get it under contract and then sell their contract, their equitable interest, uh, hoping somebody will buy it. But it's not uncommon at all that they get a property under contract and nobody does buy it. Because in that example, do you, do you wanna share what was the contract price that they offered? Uh, they were listing it for I think it was about 740. 740? Yeah. So is that what their contract was or that's just what they wanted? That's what they wanted. They wanted. Okay. So presumably their contract was something less than that. Yeah. Do you have any idea what it was? Or? Uh, when we were talking with the seller, he was asking for 670. 670? Yeah. Okay. So he wanted 670 and they wanted 720. 740, I believe. 740. Right, yeah. How much were you going to willing to pay? Uh, it depends because he was willing to do seller financing. Oh, so that's we were nice. trying to figure something out there, but yeah. at the end of the day, it, didn't, it hasn't worked out, I guess. Um, okay. But so, so do you know what the property is worth? ARV, after repair value, fix up value? Uh, ARV is probably just under a million. Under a million. Okay, so nine something. Nine fifty. Okay. 
And um, it's a sevenplex, you said? Yes, sir. Okay, so technically that's a commercial property. It's mm -hmm. a multifamily, so just for all the new people in the room, anything up to four properties is considered a residential property. A, a duplex, a fourplex is all residential real estate. As soon as you get to five units or more, it's considered commercial. So an apartment building is anything five units or more, right? So a sevenplex is a very tiny apartment building, but it technically it's a commercial apartment building, multifamily. Um, and the way you determine the value of a commercial property is different than how you determine the value of a residential property. With residential properties, values are determined by comps, comparables. So if you have two identical houses, same neighborhood, same size, same age, same features, same condition, same whatever, they'd be, both be worth the same amount. So if house number one just sold for 500,000, then the identical house number two right across the street would also sell for 500,000. That's what it's worth. Commercial real estate's quite different. You could have two exact identical properties right next to each other. Same age, same number of units, same rents, same condition, same features, same everything. But if one of them is 100% occupied and the other is only 50% occupied, the one that's 100% occupied is worth a lot more. Because the way you determine the value of a commercial property is it's a function of how much income the property actually generates. Uh, how many units were, were rented out, by the way? It was uh, six were rented, one was under renovation. Okay, so one of them was being rented. So it was mostly uh, uh, fully uh, uh, rented out uh, and probably would be soon as they get that <laughs> other unit uh, done. Was the seller motivated in any way? I think that was part of the issue he didn't seem because every offer we supplied him, he's like, well, I can just keep it. And it's like, yes, you can, but you yeah. want to sell it. <laughs> so why did he even open up to the idea of selling it? Because somebody offered him money even though he didn't have it on sale for... I think the wholesalers, the yeah, he played dumb in my opinion, but yeah. who knows at the end of the day? Yeah. So, um, you know, here's another rule when it comes to negotiating to buy real estate. As a general rule, we're real estate investors, right? And we buy wholesale. We use creative real estate investing strategies. We're going to talk about a lot of creative real estate investing strategies tonight. Um, if somebody just wants to uh, sell their house to make as much money as possible, there's probably no offer that you guys in this room could make them that they would be willing to take. You know, I will buy any house cash like that, but I only pay about 70 cents on the dollar for cash. Uh, so I offer a lump sum cash payoff. Now, some people want that. It's like when you win the lottery, right? You get the whole amount, but it's paid out over time, right? Or you can get a lump sum, right? Paid up front, but it's only 70 cents on the dollar. We offer sellers the same thing. And some people want to sell their house or have to sell their house in four days. Well, you can't hire a realtor, put it on the market, and close in four days, right? But I can buy a house in four days. I can buy a house in one day. And, and some people want that cash offer. And there's a number of other creative offers that we make as real estate investors that solve different problems that sellers might have. Um, but generally speaking, if a seller's motivation is they just want to make as much money as possible, and they're not in any hurry, they're not in financial distress, they're not moving out of the country, they don't have medical problems, they didn't lose their job, right? They just want to, you know, make as much money as possible, and if that doesn't happen, then they'll do nothing. That seller is not going to sell their property to you, okay, as a real estate investor. And a lot of very experienced real estate investors, that's the first and really sometimes only question they really want to know. Why are you selling your house? Because if you tell me why you're selling your house and it's a motivated reason, lost my job, lost my income, going through divorce, moving out of the country, whatever, right? If I know you have to sell your house, then I know you're going to either sell it to me or sell it to somebody with more negotiating skill than me. That being said, if I know you're a non-motivated seller, I know you're not gonna sell it to me and you're not going to sell it to any other real estate investor, you're gonna sell it retail, right? And, 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 you know, in general, uh, that's a whole different market, retail market versus wholesale market. We're going to talk about that. So this guy, you probably was not motivated. Yeah. He, what's that? I would, I would agree with that, probably. I think. But you said something else really interesting. You said, but he was open to selling the house with financing, mm -hmm. the property with financing. So let's talk about that. Somebody tell me, what is a property worth? How do you know what a property is worth? What's the answer? That's exactly the correct, correct answer. Did everybody hear that? What is a property worth? Whatever somebody's willing to pay for it, that's what a property's worth. Now, if a property is appraised for $100,000 by a professional appraiser, the, the next question is, what is that property worth? What is that property worth? 
whatever somebody's willing to pay for it. If a property appraises for $100,000 and it's sold on a tax auction, it'll probably sell for about $50,000. If a property appraises for $100,000 and it's sold by a distressed seller, seller to a, a distressed motivated seller to a, to a, to a cash buyer, it'll probably sell for about $70,000. If a if a house appraises for $100,000 and it's sold to, to a retail buyer who just working with a realtor buys a house off the MLS, gets a loan from Bank of America, it'll probably sell for $100,000. If a house appraises for $100,000 and it's sold to a buyer that could not qualify to get a loan from Bank of America, but instead bought the house with financing provided by the seller, seller financing, it will probably sell for about $120,000. Notice that exact same house that appraised for $100,000 might sell for anywhere from $50,000 all the way up to $120,000, right? Just depending on the circumstances. Isn't that interesting? So that's what it's worth. Well, it's worth different amounts in different circumstances. Now, under which of those circumstances is that house worth a premium amount? The last one I gave you, seller financing. If a house is sold to a buyer that could not get financing, conventional financing from a bank, but got the financing from the seller, that house will typically sell for 10, 20, or even 30% over the appraised value because that's what it's worth to that buyer in that situation. So that's very interesting that the guy says he's open to seller financing, okay? And I'm gonna tell you as a seller, if you ever want to sell a property faster and for more money, offer it with seller financing. You will always get a premium price and it will always sell much faster because there's very few people that are providing the financing so when you sell a house with seller financing, you're generally got 14 buyers for every one seller, okay? Now, uh, it's also a fantastic way to buy real estate as real estate investors, uh, because as real estate investors, here's the deal. Um, you only have so much money. Uh, I only have so much money. And it turns out I don't have enough money to be a real estate investor. In fact, none of you have enough money to be real estate investors. Donald Trump does not have enough money to be a real estate investor. I don't care what you have, not enough, not even close. You got half a million dollars in your checking account. Good for you. Go buy a house. Now you're done. Yeah. You, you, know, you can't buy another house, so you sell the house you have. That doesn't scale. You have to be prepared to buy any house at any time at any price because you have no, no idea what that great deal that you're going to find tomorrow looks like. Okay, so you have to find ways to buy real estate. If you want to accumulate wealth in this business, you have to find ways of buying and holding real estate that requires little or no money and little or no credit. And one way to do that is with seller financing. Because if the seller is willing to finance the property, maybe with no money down, then how many properties can you buy? The answer is all of them. So did you ever get into the terms for the seller financing? Uh, we sent him three proposals of you know X, 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 Y, Z, and at the end of the day, he wanted too much. Like we sent him all this, he's like, I want this much amount uh, every month and just the numbers didn't work. He was pretty stuck on his number, which was a thousand bucks more than what we were willing to pay on a monthly basis. Okay. Well, let's talk about that. Um, first of all, there was something you're saying that was, uh, got, me, got me there. You sent him a bunch of offers. Um, why did you send him a bunch of offers? We're new at this, to say the least. Okay, no, <laughs> we no sent problem, him no problem. Three different ones, just yeah. that worked with us. That yeah. you know, it's it's either you know, it's either it's a win-win either way, depending on which one he takes. Uh, yeah, but and, uh, where, where you got me was when you said send offers. Mm -hmm. um, you're you're ninety percent more likely to get a property under contract face to face than yeah. than in through email or <laughs> did you talk through them, mm -hmm. Zoom call something. Uh, my partner was the one who reached out to him via phone and he was, he talked to him multiple times on the phone and through okay. the offers. And I mean, in general, even if they're out of state, I would mm -hmm. Zoom call them, you know, yeah. get, them, get them on a call so you can interact, see their reactions, yeah. uh, try to figure out what it is that they might be open to. And it sounds like the, the, the terms you got in trouble with was your monthly payment. Is that it? At the end of the day, he wanted more than what we were willing to. Okay. What, what interest rate did he want? Uh, just market rates. That's all he gave us. Was he What's was like, wrong with market rate. rates? Those Nothing. are great rates. <laughs> yeah. So they just wanted market rates. Mm -hmm. 
How much did he want down? Uh, well, what he wanted down was something we weren't willing to do. Was okay. Uh, probably the biggest. Uh, I don't know. He wanted more down. He also wanted a higher monthly payment. So. Okay, but he said he just wanted market rates for mm -hmm. interest rates. Yeah. That's all you're going to get anywhere else, yeah. right? So, <laughs> I mean, you know, when you say the interest rate was too high, it's like market rates. Usually, when I sell a house with seller financing, I charge a premium. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, it, you're going to charge anywhere from two to six percent higher than market rates. I mean, a lot more than market rates. Uh, so if this guy's willing to do seller financing and do market rates. That's really an incredible deal. With how much he wanted monthly, it probably would have pushed it up to a premium because he told us market rates. And then he was like, well, I want at least this much a month. And so he, well, I mean, the, 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 the way a loan is calculated is like, you know, you're going to buy it for a million or whatever the number is. You're going to put whatever down, a hundred thousand dollars. So you're going to borrow nine hundred thousand, right? And then you're going to charge four point five percent interest, whatever, you know. And that's whatever a month. I mean, that's that that's you don't when you make a loan, you don't say I want uh, you know eight thousand a month, and you know it's like no, you say what the uh, balance is and what the interest rate is, and then out of that gets calculated whatever the monthly payment was. Were you concerned about the cash flow on the property? Uh, with how much he wanted, yes. Uh, yeah. With how much we were willing to offer, no. <laughs> What's the total rent for the property? Just curious. Uh, the total rent, I believe it will, it's, assuming the 7-1 gets rented, it was just under 6,000. Um, hmm. Without that, it was about 4,400, I think. Okay, what, what was the payment gonna be uh, when you? He wanted 3,500. 3500 what he wanted. We were willing to offer. For a million dollar property. Yeah. I don't know. Sounds, sounds like not a bad deal to me. No, no, it doesn't. So what's that? Well, it was, uh, we were buying it at 650 or uh, 670 mark. At 650? Yeah. Wow. You get a discount market rates, right? Mm -hmm. How much did he want down? Uh, he wanted, well, uh, he wanted 15 down. 15,000 yeah. or 15%? 15 percent. Yeah. So. Eh, it's a little high for seller financing, yeah. but I don't know. Um, and at the end of the day, did you get it under contract? No. So here's a suggestion. Um, number one, it sounds like there's a deal that he'd be willing to take. And um, I don't know the property. Obviously, I don't know much about the deal. But from what you're describing, it sounds like it's probably not a bad deal, maybe a good deal. I mean, you know, with more due diligence, maybe it's a terrible deal. I don't know, but it, I'm, I'm, you're not saying anything about this deal that's making me think like, I don't want that deal. I'm thinking like, wow, it sounds like a pretty good deal, right? So my suggestion is just get it under contract with the best terms that you can negotiate with him. Why not? And then once you get it under contract, decide if you want it. Because here's how real estate investors operate. Ready, fire, aim, okay? You make the offer, you get it under contract, and then you look for the money. And then you do your due diligence. And then you negotiate. And then you renegotiate. And it's easier to renegotiate than it is to negotiate. And then you find somebody like me or somebody else in a network that might want to buy that property from you. So now you're the wholesaler. And I'll give you a little tip about being the wholesaler. So some wholesaler got this thing under contract for cash, right? Couldn't come up with the cash, couldn't find the buyer, walked away. I'm going to tell you if you want to sell a property faster in a premium price, offer the financing. If you get it under contract with the financing, that contract is a much more valuable contract than the contract the wholesaler tried to sell to you, right? And that will be 14 times easier to find a buyer for because there's a lot of people that want to buy a commercial property with financing, with market rates, right? With cash flow, with maybe 15 or less percent down. If I wanted to go buy that commercial off of the MLS, I'm going to have to come up with right now about 30% down. Okay, I'm going to have to use probably my own credit and I'm not going to get any better than market rates. Uh, and I'm probably going to pay full retail price. So what you're describing sounds like, right? Better down payment, much better, like 15 versus 30. Market rates, competitive rates, financing doesn't bother with my credit. 
I mean, sounds like there's a lot of people that might want that deal. All right, so something to think about. So thank you, appreciate it. <laughs> Anybody else have a project they're working on? Any else have a project they're working on? So again, for you guys that just arrived, we're doing a kind of little early presentation. The main presentation is gonna start uh, shortly. Um, and uh, we're uh, uh, doing kind of some just uh, interviewing of people in the audience to uh, see uh, um, kind of uh, who's working on what, uh, do a little live coaching, I guess you could say, uh, which is kind of fun to do. Um, the presentation, the main presentation will start, uh, you know, in, uh, in just a few minutes. We're also live casting for if you're wondering why I keep looking at this uh, set of cameras up in front of me. We've got an audience uh, online as well, and the live broadcast will start at around uh, 630. Um, so, uh, and we always like to start uh, again with some, some live coaching. Uh, I do have a little announcement to make, um, and um, I don't know if any of you are aware, uh, this uh, network is sponsored by Texas RIAs, which is the largest network by far of real estate investor associations in the great state of Texas. Uh, and among other things that we do, uh, we actually have a, uh, a little online uh, TV show where we interview the, uh, the members of this uh, network. Uh, we have lots and lots of people that sat in the same chairs you're sitting in right now. Texas RIAs has been around since 2003. Uh, and we have lots of people that have literally sat through the same chairs you guys are sitting through, joined this network, and went on to become multimillionaire real estate investors. And we actually have a little show uh, called Houses Flipping People. Isn't that clever? Uh, you know, normally it's people flipping houses, but we still call our show Houses Flipping People uh, because it's about the transformation of people that become real estate investors. And uh, I've got the uh, host of the show, Olivia, up here. So Olivia, let me see if I can get the, uh, the thing going here. Can you tell everybody a little bit about the show? Hi guys, I'm Olivia. I'm the host of House Flipping People and I was sitting exactly on this chair with you guys uh, about four years ago. And because of my story and how much I have been listening to all the investors inside of Texas, we, uh, how much real estate has transformed their lives, and that's how we became with Houses Flipping People. I go around Texas and I interview all the members of Texas Rio who has a fix and flip or a deal. And I say about what happened on that deal and how much has real estate actually transformed their life. Not just the house, the neighborhood, but their actual life, their family member, and everyone that is around them. So I'd love to feature you guys on the show as well. So I'm excited to have you guys here. Well, thank you for that. And, and how has real estate transformed your life? Do you want to share any of uh, any more of kind of your story from the time you were sitting in this room to uh, the time what you're doing now? You just bought a house this last week. Is that right? Yes, I closed on another deal in Austin uh, last Thursday or Friday and I'm um, doing multiple projects and here in San Antonio, right on your guys background. Uh, Austin, I have deals in Houston. And when I came to this event, I didn't know anything about the real estate invest. I didn't even know that was possible to become an investor. And I just came in being a guest of someone and I'm like, that was my aha moment. It completely changed my life and it's changing even my boy. So, so what, what were some of your preconceived notions? Why did you think you, um, why, why did you think you couldn't invest in real estate? I didn't know. I didn't know that we can actually be a real estate investor without money. And I, until today, using everybody else's money, including the chairman who is sitting yeah, right there here. there you go. So Absolutely. Yeah, hands so. down. If, you, if I need a deal or money, I, you guys yeah. bring me a deal and he'll be my money person. Uh, but I'm, a, I'm a, one of the many lenders within this network. Yes. We have over a thousand private money lenders uh, within the network. And that is a very common preconceived notion. I mean, a lot of people think, oh, you got to money a real estate investor. And it kind of, it, it, on the one hand, it sounds like, yeah, of course you have to have money to be a real estate investor. But then, if you really think about it, it doesn't make sense. Because let's say you have money. Like I said before, you got half a million dollars sitting in your checking account. What's that gonna do? It's not gonna do anything. You buy one house, now you have no money in your checking account. Now you're done, right? You, you have to use other people's money, no matter how much money you have, right? If you have money when you get started, all that will do is help you with the first deal. And then you're right back to not having money. So the only way to do this business is to use other people's money. Now, why would somebody loan you money? Well, why do I loan people money? 
I get a first lien. So if somebody finds a property that's worth, let's say, 600000 And no, you got one. And what's the one you're doing in Georgetown? So. Oh, um, yeah, that one is, uh, I think it's, I, I closed 400 k but I think it's worth it. Um, I'm going to be put on the market. I have a project manager right now as we talk. Uh, I think I'm going to be putting on the market for 750 or Se 750. So oh. you bought the property for 400,000. Yeah. Okay. Who loaned you the money? I did. Yeah. Okay. And why did I do that? N you know, not because I'm a nice guy. I have a first lien on that property. Okay. And I'm getting 10% interest. First lien, 10% interest. If Olivia gets hit by a bus, I get that property that's worth 700,000 plus, right? That I loan 400 to buy. So it's completely safe. If the loan defaults, I get the property, which is worth much more than the loan itself, right? Safe, high interest. That's like better than anything Wall Street offers, right? That's a really good deal. So when I do a loan, and I would suggest any of you that become lenders, when you do a loan, only do a first lien on a property that you verify is worth much more than the amount that you're buying it for. Okay, now, you're gonna spend how much to fix up this property? Uh I think my budget for that one, because I'm doing a pre-rehab, I think it's going to be about 30K. And so I'll put it's a market. minor rehab. A pre-rehab is, there's, there's a rehab and then there's something we call a prehab. A prehab, you know, you could spend on that house, you could spend $150,000 and you could make it perfect in like every way. Yes. But there's always multiple scenarios when you're renovating a house. Sometimes your best scenario, instead of doing a rehab, is to do a prehab. You ever heard the expression, put lipstick on the pig? I'm sorry, I mean, that's an expression, but what does that mean? Instead of making the house beautiful and perfect, make it lendable, make it good enough. Make sure the air conditioner blows cold air, uh, make sure Plumbing. there's nothing dangerous about it, right? Make sure the roof doesn't leak. Uh, it's dried in, means all the windows and doors are, are, are they lock and they, they, they open and shut and, and the locks work. Uh, but other than that, leave it. Oh, now a buyer's going to come in and they're going to say, well, this is kind of a piece of crap, right? This thing, it needs new cabinets. It needs new, you know, uh, dishwashers and appliances. It needs new carpet. It needs new paint. It needs all this stuff. Oh, but it is a hundred thousand dollars less than all the other properties around it. So you can spend 150,000 to do a full renovation. And then maybe when you do 150,000, maybe you get another 100,000 when you sell it, you can spend $30,000 to do a minor renovation, right? And, and sell it for 100,000 or less. Well, you saved 120 to make 100, right? You're still ahead. Yeah. And it's a lot easier to do a $30,000 remodel than a $100,000 or $150,000 remodel. So that's the difference between a prehab and a rehab. With a prehab, you need to make it nice enough. Not all houses are eligible for a prehab. It, it has to be lendable, yeah. has to be level, has to be safe. Uh, it, can, it has to be something that's livable uh, that you could get a loan on. Um, but a prehab is a strategy. Today we're in like the hottest real estate market that's ever existed in the history of the state of Texas. So you and you were there. Uh, it's pretty easy to sell pretty much anything. If you cannot sell a house in this market, there's something seriously wrong with that house, right? It's like, you know, you can sell anything. Uh, so we're doing more of these prehabs. And I got to tell you, the nicest house in a neighborhood may or may not sell. The cheapest house in a neighborhood will always sell. So I don't feel bad when I do a prehab, when I'm selling a house that's not that nice because I am giving a value to the buyer. I'm giving a buyer an opportunity to afford to buy something that they might not otherwise be able to afford, right? And they can maybe, when they get around to it, paint it themselves and put in new cabinets and put in new appliances and make it into a beautiful house and they can add that value with some sweat equity uh, and, and that's a value. That's a service you're providing when you're providing a cheaper, more affordable house into that community. So any other uh, advice for people that are just getting started? I'm glad you guys are here. You're definitely in the right place. And I hope you guys become an investor with us. And I'd love to feature you guys on House of Sleeping People. All righty. Well, thank you, Olivia. Appreciate that. I appreciate that a lot. And uh, we have a little commercial I'm going to play for the people online, so we'll play this. Houses Flipping People is sponsored by Texas REITs, the largest network of real estate investor associations in Texas. So if you have even the slightest interest in investing in real estate, come to one of our local free meetings to learn how. Click on the link below. Yeah. 
And if you actually watch the uh, show, uh, Houses Flipping People, you can go to YouTube and just search Houses Flipping People. Uh, you'll see a lot of great stories. Uh, Flavia, a, a baker, uh, had a nice baking business, and then the, the pandemic hit, and she literally, like that, lost her business, right? Had to close her bakery, so she had to quickly find something else to do uh, that could make her uh, a nice income and living. Uh, she became a real estate investor with the help of Texas Rias, uh, and it transformed her life and uh, gave her a career. She's not going back to the baker business because she can make more money doing what she's doing now. Uh, Jeff uh, was working in a Fortune 500, uh, wanted to do something different with his life. Uh, went through kind of a tough transition, a divorce, uh, kind of starting everything all over again, became a real estate investor, and, and first year made a, a half a million dollars. Not bad. Mike and Vanessa, uh, a couple of contractors that wanted to kind of get paid on the other part of the HUD. Contractors used to working for investors, so they were helping all these investors make all these money, you know, flip, fixing and, and the houses they were flipping. So after helping a bunch of investors do that, they're like, you know, I think we want to make the big money instead of the little money by being the investor themselves. So they did a major renovation project and they actually made two million profit, you're reading it correctly, two million profit on a single flip. Pretty amazing story. Uh, I don't remember the numbers that are in the, the video, but they bought a property for somewhere around three, sold it for close to six had to spend a couple million dollars or a million or whatever to, uh, to get there. Um, so uh, that was a pretty amazing story. Uh, realtors becoming real estate investors, therapists becoming a real estate investors. People come to real estate from all walks of life, uh, all kinds of different backgrounds, uh, and real estate can be very transformational. Uh, so if you'd like to kind of see some of their stories, uh, go ahead and check out Houses Flipping People. Uh, and with that, I'm going to stop our recording.